Ron, welcome to Design and Dialogue. It's fantastic to have you here with us. Nice to be here. Yep. Well, I'm a and uh, you are coming to us from London, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to repeat something Lucy just said, we'll be picking up questions at the end, end of our talk. So we'll, Ron and I will- We, we, we could start with questions. Oh, well, I'm gonna start with questions in a second, but- uh, uh, Are you we, going to? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. But uh, if you have a question for Ron, just put it in the chat box and we will come to you at the end in about 45 minutes. The answer is no. <laughs> it's either no or yes. Nothing in between. So yeah. uh, you're, Maybe. you're a man of extremes. So Ron, um, how are you reacting to the situation that we've all found ourselves plunged into together? Um, how, first of all, I am working from home hmm. and all my team, everyone's working from home and you discover new things about your day, about your habits. The thing is that the clock disappeared. It doesn't matter what time it is. What day is it today? I don't mm -hmm. even know. Um, well, I was going to say, Ron, it is your birthday, so. It is my birthday, yeah, so it's <laughs> Friday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah. And yesterday was William Shakespeare's birthday, mm. and we used it to launch a, a campaign that is uh, to do with the coronavirus, mm -hmm. to do with masks. Uh, it started with a, a very simple idea of let's put art on masks. Uh, and it's let's let's uh, let's have let's complete the bottom of people's faces, uh, and let's you know let's let Dali do it and Picasso and Matisse and me, mm. <laughs> and uh, we started uh, a charity it's called, called Smile for the NHS, which is the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. And uh, I joined with a I joined a charity uh, philanthropic entrepreneur people called Fair Share, and it's just dominated the life in the last days. Uh, mm. Don't know myself. Mm. Uh, it is like getting WhatsApps all the time and exchanging. And now, ah, shall we do this? Shall we do that? Shall we ask this person? And uh, we have launched it yesterday. I mean, if you look at my Instagram. Yes, Ron Arad Studio on Instagram. Well, but maybe I can show you what I put on Instagram. I put on Instagram a film a bit like this one here. Mm. And it is me wearing, uh, hang on, is it not playing? And I don't remember my passcode. Wait, wait, oops, let's start again. I'll start again. Happy birthday, William Shakespeare. The only problem is that my face ID is not recognized by my iPhone and I don't remember my passcode. But still, happy birthday, William. Anyway, so, so and we had all sorts of personalities. I don't want to use the word celebrities, but personalities that uh, were very happy to join us and, and, to, and to pose with Mm. With, our, with our masks and we're doing that parallel to starting the production and yes next week we'll, we'll be able to to produce 3,000 a day mm. and there's uh, there's you, I mean rather than me showing you you can you can look for it if you go to to my Instagram it will give you a link yeah. to the web of the well, charity it's, it's amazing how quickly these things can start and happen now and um, in a way it, it serves as a good segue into the early part of your career, which is how I thought we might start our conversation today, because uh, you know you're still being entrepreneurial, inventive, projecting things out into the I'm world. Not, I'm not entrepreneurial. I mean, I'm, I'm, for me, business was always a necessary evil. Uh huh. I never, I, mean, I never liked slogans like uh, "good design is good business." Hmm. I mean, we don't design for the business. The business is there to support uh, our design to. Su support uh, sort of. So has, has it been your theory that if you generate enough energy, the business will simply come to you and it will all work out? I don't mean, I can, I can, I can, Sotsa says a really nice quote, Ettore Sotsa, he said, money is very jealous. Hmm. If you ignore it, it will run up to you. <laughs> 
And uh, I, I know I never, I never, ever, ever, uh, I never, people always thought, oh, that I'm a very good entrepreneur. I'm very good at PR. The contrary. I mean, I'm not interested in. in yeah, but you well. were, you were very good, however, at um, doing a lot with a little, particularly at the beginning. It's because mm -hmm. I'm lazy. It's because yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not a methodical person. I, I, I jump from one thing to, to the other. I don't have, I mean, I do adore people like, say, Giacometti, who all his life did the same thing, amazing stuff, you know, like with his feet. I tend to, I, I can jump from, I can see a traffic light changing and it can give me an idea and I'll go and and uh, it's it's a uh, I am I'm doing a lot because I'm lazy. I know it sounds like when you think about the um, and you, you please feel free to show us some images when you feel ready. Whatever you want to see. You know, it, it, let's go ahead and start looking at things because you have so many things to show us. So, do you want to share your screen with us so we can jump jump into your world? Okay, let me let me do. Ta -dum, ta -dum. Share screen. Screen. Uh, start broadcast. Uh, tell me if you see my screen. We do. You, you do see my screen. We do. Thank you. And uh, I'll go here. So this uh, is Planet Arid we're in now, exploring. Yeah. And I, uh, wanted, if, I wanted to go if to you. See anything, if you see anything confidential, don't tell anyone, okay? <laughs> this is entirely between us, Ron. Yeah. And uh, but, you know, like at, at the beginning, you know, as lots of you know that I, I studied architecture uh, because I, when I studied architecture, no one was building anything. Mm. Uh, and architecture was totally conceptual. The product was the drawings. The product was performances, not the building. If someone built something, they had to apologize. Uh, it was architecture those days were very jealous of conceptual art. Mm. I went to study at the Architectural Association. I went to the IA. Um, yeah. Because when I visited it, it looked to me more like how I imagine an art school to be mm. than, say, the Slade, which was the art school or the Royal, Royal College. Um, and, who. And do you remember feel like that was born out in practice when you encountered the people at the AA? Did you feel like they were operating conceptually rather than commercially? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, yeah, there's, look, the, the AA was a very pluralistic place. Mm. It was used to be run by someone called Alvin Boyarsky. Mm. And you could never tell if he's a real pluralist or is totally indifferent. <laughs> you know? but anyway, it served us. And then later, when I ran the design product course at the Royal uh, College of Art, I uh, m tried to make it as pluralistic as I could. Mm. And it, uh, anyway, so... When you I, left I, the AA, I want to um, ask you about the, the infamous, famous infamous rover chair, which we're looking at right at the top there, because uh, yeah. when you said you were lazy, it was the first thing that came to mind because it suggests that the use of a found object, in this case, the chair from a, uh, the seat from a car, that that could be a kind of shortcut. Yeah, I was, I was working for, I did my, my duty and I, after I graduated, I, I worked for some architectural office. And it didn't take me very long to find out that I'm not cut to work for other people. Hmm. And uh, it didn't take me very long to know that it's a lot more difficult to work for other people after lunch. <laughs> so, so one lunchtime, I didn't come back and I went to a scrapyard. Uh, I had this idea to, to uh, ah, drawings were always my, my tool. Like, this is the first real ever, the first ever drawing of the robot chair when I had the idea. After I visited the scrapyard, I had to find, to find which is going to be the chair that I'll, the, the car seat that I'll choose to make a domestic piece of furniture. And I knew it 
it can't be any old car seat. Uh, I had to, it had to be, I had to stick to one. Mm. And that, and uh, so, I mean, this is, by the way, you don't believe me, but I can see it. There's one on my right here and one on my left. The first two chairs that I've ever done. Uh, and uh, the funny thing is that when it was shown in my retrospective at, at the <coughs> Centre Pompidou and later at the MoMA, but at the Centre Pompidou, when we arranged the exhibition, I wanted to move it half a meter from one side to the other. I was shouted at, not without white gloves. <laughs> and uh, this is the chair that, you know, my cats used to live. I was the, the lender. <laughs> we call that patina, Ron, the cat scratch. Yeah. 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 Anyway, Can I so, ask you um, about the rover chair? You know, one thing that I think is worth pointing out is that although the rover seat is the core of it, and it, it is, as you used to say, a blind date with an object, a sort of Duchampian move, it also has this infrastructure around it that is at least logically connected to this whole uh, unfurling set of projects that you did with key clamps at the time. And yeah, I, I mean, to talk about that as a system that, because it's not just a found object, it's a found yeah. object that's I mean, been the, amplified the, by a system. The key clamps was another found object. It, it is like a scaffolding system, slightly more refined. Yeah. That was designed in 1930 by someone called Gascoigne. And it was designed for milking parlors, not for us human beings, but for cows. And that is, I took that and I made, I made a living out of it uh, before I knew what I was doing. Mm. But, but you see, this is like a, a, a picture of my studio those days. You can see that the door used to be a bus door that I took from somewhere. Ah. You see a key clamp version of, of, uh, a rocking chair that later I, I did without key clamps, but the first one, and and you see the first the first uh, ever robot chair. So this is like 1981, yeah. Yeah, I mean you you're the historian. I don't know. It was a long time ago. I think that's right. Why did you call it one off the studio? Because I I at that time I thought that one off is one of production. It's only one of a kind. It's uh, I thought, what's the point of once I design something? Uh, I didn't understand those days. I didn't know anything about the joy of mass production. Mm. Uh, because, but I learned about it and I love mass production. Uh, but those days, uh, one off was sort of, I'm only doing one offs. I'm not, you know, I'm not interested in anything else. This is a good, this is, I mean, do you mind if I move on? Or? Well, can you not move on quite so far? Because I wanted okay. to make sure we hit the concrete stereo, which is one of my favorite of your designs, and another, uh, uh, another kind of blind date with an object. A but also, it, it so evokes let, let, the moment. Let, you know? me, let, let me find the concrete stereo. Yeah, here it is. The concrete. Yeah. Okay. This is the concrete yeah. stereo. I yeah. think, if I'm not wrong, uh, Lucy, let, tell me later, I think you have one in your collection and I'm very jealous because we only made 10 of them. Mm. And uh, it was uh, a turntable casting concrete. That's what I could do. I mean, I, if I, I couldn't do like uh, anything industrial, I didn't know anything about industrial design or no one asked me to do it, but I could cast concrete and I could, I could, uh, chip it and expose the electronic components. I thought I am showing beauty where it's normally um, hidden. Yeah, like I opening up the I black think, box, yeah. I didn't think that I'm doing anything uh, destructive, mm. but, uh, but the French called, called my style that they thought I invented ruinism, <laughs> ruinist. Uh, uh, the, and uh, I, okay, it helped me. That that mis misinterpretation helped me, because when they did the exhibition to celebrate the tenth year, the ten tenth anniversary of the Pompidou Center, they did an exhibition called Les Nouvelles Tendances, mm -hmm. and they uh, in, invited people that represented all the tendencies, and then someone had this bad idea. 
uh, would it be a good idea to have a ruinist? And I was the youngest exhibitor there. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe, it, maybe, it's, is it, maybe it's here somewhere. I did, I did a machine called, an installation called Sticks and Stones, mm -hmm. where I uh, invited the Parisians to, to bring chairs, the favorite chairs or the least favorite chairs, place them on a conveyor belt and have them uh, squashed into a, into a brick. Yeah, it was like a digestion machine, yes? Yeah. Do you it have is a picture a, of that? I have a picture of the, mm -hmm. I will, the, you know, I, I, will, I, will, I, can, I, can, I can find it later, but it is. This relates to another question I wanted to ask you though, because that project, the Sticks and Stones project, where you're literally compacting and crushing these existing objects. Yeah. You know, I, I, and the idea of ruinism, which was sort of applied to you, and even the idea of the one-off, it seems to me like that all adds up to a picture of you being quite antagonistic and aggressive in relationship to mass production. So not only not missing the joy of it or the potential, but also in a way acting against it as a kind of enfant terrible. As Look, a I, don't, I don't mind misinterpretations uh, <laughs> because uh, you see that uh, an example of a misinterpretation that um, made me, they made them select me to something that I think I wasn't. And I, I didn't, it wasn't, I was doing what I could, trying to do beautiful things, mm. not, to, not to destroy. I mean, it came back when I did the exhibition of the flat fiats. Yeah. When I came, when I, uh, when I, um, Can you show us that? That's great to see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me show you the first. Uh, the, this Hello. is the toy. Hello. Let's give it up. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's the story. And what, uh, I was in Italy when I did it, and I sent it to the studio and said, "Can you make like a, a Photoshop of as if it's on the gallery wall?" That was the holy grail. Then I, I thought, mm. "How how am I going to get it? I want it to be as thin as paper." And it was a long journey to 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 find how to do it. Mm. Um, I the, the people in Italy that do a lot of my stuff. Uh, they said to me, ah, we can do it a la casa. And I said, really? Uh, <laughs> what are you going to do, Roberto? Are you going to do it like this? And little did I know that, that he already built a machine, uh, a, a thing to do it, but it was not uh, satisfying because it wasn't as flat as I wanted it to be. I although see. they put a 20 ton thing on it. <laughs> and, and after that, without even asking me, they took took it I to... I was tortured by a digger, and it's all to be even, sort of I mean, this is not me. That's not what I wanted to do. Film. I'm very I think glad Tarantino would be happy with it, but not me. I thought, yeah. By the way, for the record, Ron, who is Roberto? Is close to the Roberto is the, my fabricator, Roberto Travaglia. You know, we, you know the, we had a date. Uh, so look, and, time and, was thinking, but, and we had to find a, a solution. Anyway, I said, no, that's everywhere. not what I want. In, including I don't, a place called Sandwich. Not, I'm, not a, a I'm not a ruinist. Mm -hmm. and but. Then uh, I, have an, I have an affair with this Fiat 500. And I went to my garage that looked after my car for a long time and told them what I want to do. And they started crying. And I said, but listen, listen, I'm not, I'm not destroying the cars. I'm immortalizing them. Mm. I'm immortalizing them. And they understood and they helped me and they prepared me with all these cars for me. And we took them to Holland to a shipbuilder. And we, uh, okay, let's see, there's, there's the yellow one. So is that some kind of hydraulic press, Ron? It is a, a metal manipulating press. They, we had to build the plates. And uh, it's funny, this is on a weekend. All the people you see in, uh, in blue overalls are normally blue colored, uh, engineers and people that sit at the desks 
Mm. They were so happy to join me and, and have a day out here. Yeah. So we did, we pressed, you know, mm. it took a half a year to arrive there, but we pressed six cars. And uh, so what you get is this. Morning, it's... Finished by lunch, <laughs> then it would be uh, embalmed in, uh, to, make, to become a bedroom or gallery friendly. Mm. And then, I mean, I won't show you all, the, but that's the, the yellow one on the wall. Mm. By the way, those of you, and some people of you might have seen it at Paul Kasmin's gallery. Yeah, rest in peace, Paul Kasmin. Yeah. yeah, yeah, rest in peace, Paul. Uh, this is the white one. I got this from Toby Webster that used to work for me. Then he opened the Modern Institute, one of the leading galleries. And I think, and this car, I convinced him to give it to me. And when he saw it, he said, hey, my seat, my seat were red. I said, yes, but Toby, I wanted a black and white piece. Mm. Here are your seats in this one. <laughs> and uh, this, this is my favorite. I don't know. The biggest decision was which, which side are we showing? A or B? Right. So, uh, and I, I, like, I like this one. And it's kind of weirdly perspectival, isn't it? It's like yeah, it's yeah. run into it's, an accident. And the nice, the nice thing is that people, that, so everyone had a different favorite. <clears throat> and children liked it, they could see the perspective of, of, of them. And then I, Fiat, were kind enough to lend me the original wooden buck of the 500. Amazing piece. It was done before uh, computers, before CNC cutting machines. And carved, no? And, car and drawn. Yeah. And carved, you know, with, with chisels and rasps and amazing. The only problem with them lending me this is that you don't want the most beautiful piece in your show to be by someone else. <laughs> so I had to, I had to think, oh, what, what, what am I doing? So I, isn't it beautiful? So gorgeous. That's it fascinating is. though, Ron, because in a way what you did was to take the mass produced and turn it back into a unique object through this crushing process, no? I tell you, this show was called In Reverse mm. because after I had my retrospective at the MoMA, at the Barbican, at the Pompidou Center, this is in the museum I designed in Holon, the design museum. And I didn't want to do another retrospective. I mean, it's, uh, no. And I did a cloud of retrospective. It's, uh, the exhibition was about going from the physical, the manual, to the digital. Mm. So, and also it's called in reverse because normally you start with 2D and you make a three-dimensional thing and to make, you try to make a functional thing. Here I took a functional three-dimensional object and turned it into a two-dimensional object. Mm. So it's all in reverse. Now let's go back to this. I made this piece. Uh, this this one is by uh, Dante Giacosa. He is the designer of of the Fiat 500. Yeah, uh -huh. and, and this is called Rodi Giacosa. I mm. made this out of rods, um, and it is. It took like six people, three teams of two, uh, half a year uh, to to make to go, and it is. Uh, pretty amazing that you can only do one rod after you did the other. It's not, and it is, yes, the, the, the grid, the lattice there is laser cut and, and we achieved it by a computer, but it relied on the artisans. Mm. It relied on, on, on amazing, uh, let's see, uh, you can see, like every candy corn has to be and I used to go and visit them and ask them, do you hate me? No, no, we love you. They, they really enjoyed it. And there, there I, mm. I put in the... So he was just polishing the rods, is that what we were seeing, Ron? The corner, making, sculpting the corner. And this that's your, your big easy chair as an icon. Yeah, little number plate. And also, I can tell you another thing that you might, don't blame me if you don't know, there's bronze, bronze and stainless steel. For those of you who don't know, uh, my name Arad 
in Hebrew means bronze. So that yeah. was my. You were you were born Vulcan. <laughs> I was, yeah. and yeah. anyway. Well, I love, can, I, can I ask you I a, a kind of philosophical question about this project that relates to the whole of your career, which is... Let's look at, look at this beautiful B side of it. It's like an Aborigine painting. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't have done it better myself. It has all the handwriting of, mm. of the amazing artisans. I didn't tell them how, you know, it's just like... It's like a Nazca line drawing. In it the is amazing to get something that is 10 times better than what you deserve. Well, th that's that's sort of what I wanted to ask you about because it seems to me like this project is very emblematic of your work in general, and that it has a super dynamic relationship between the artisanal and the industrial. It's like you you've identified this free space of operation where both of them are being actualized at the same time. Is that something you respond to? The idea that you're kind of taking the art artisanal and the industrial, adding them into a stew, and then cooking it up. Yeah, if that's what I'm working with, but I can do the same with, with the, the latest technology. Mm. I love both. I love, I love doing things by hand myself. I love working with Italian amazing artisans. I like working with amazing five axis mi milling machines. Yeah. It's not one or the other. I don't have to, to join. Yeah, it's the both it's and. A very, yeah. It's a very similar discussion about I don't know if you'll get into it about art and design it's, or in architecture. It's the same thing. Mm. Uh, it's all of, all of the above. I don't have to choose. The, now, this is another thing that uh, after we build the lattice to make the, uh, the piece, uh, I thought, hmm, we have another piece that we got for free, which is this. Mm. It's, called this it's called BTT, Blame the Tools. So this is the tool that uh, we use to make to make the uh, and water. it's it's an echo of the original wooden model, right? Because that was also something made that yeah. was a tool used to make the cars. Yeah, it is, and it is an amazing outdoors piece, and it's all made out of stainless steel completely, so it can live outdoors mm -hmm. forever. I always people sometimes by mistake remove the green belt and say no no the, the green belt is part of it <laughs> uh, and the other side of it is doing this in uh, i told you the digital against the uh, the physical so mm -hmm. this we did this little crushing in the studio but um if it was 20 years ago i'd be very very happy with it it's beautiful, but I wanted to be like more realistic. So we went to a, uh, we, to a company that, that specializes in uh, making models of exit of car crashes and things to, uh, to see what happens. Uh. And we had all the files, all the, the computer files from Fiat and it's funny, Fiat was an amazing collaborator. I crushed the cars and, and later they asked me to design the, the motor show in Paris. But anyway, so that's... Do you have so any comment about the violence <laughs> implicit in these works? Because it, it makes nope. me think of that cliche about slowing down to look at a car yeah. crack on the side uh, of the no, road. No, no. <laughs> uh, no violence at all. Already? all Just uh, immortalizing, making beautiful things. Uh -huh. Let me, um, can I go back uh, to a uh, uh, Let me finish this. This is the final yeah, yeah, yeah. that we did with uh, All over Italy, they know the you got to be Yeah, we can hear Papa Piccolino, Papa Piccolino, he played the pretty Whoa. Can you hear the sound of that? Nice. The advantage of doing the digital crossing is that it comes back to life. You can reverse. You can reverse. Yeah. Sorry, you were asking me questions. Well, I was going to bring you back a, a little ways because you, I noticed the tinker chair fly past. A few okay. moments ago. I'll go, I'll go back to the tinker chair. Yeah, could we? Because what I want to what I want to ask you about is the moment 
where you moved from doing everything in London in your studio through one off to working in Italy with Mm -hmm. industrial collaborators. And to me, the, the transition from the tinker chair was this very extreme. I don't know if you can show it to people, but if it, it, it's this very extreme, hand wrought, anarchic form, I remember reading somewhere that you had said you wanted to just beat a piece of metal until it admitted that it was comfortable. Yes, I said that. Yeah. Yeah. So this so very he, very direct the, object. Ten people standing around me, and each one tried and gave comment. Can you can you hammer a little more? The the lower back is a bit aggressive. Okay. I had a rubber mallet and I shaped can you it show it. can you show us a picture of it, Ron? Of of what? Of, of the tinker chair. Yeah, you can see it. Oh no, we're not seeing it. Sorry. I guess our the screen froze on our end. You, you, I thought I'm showing it to you. I'm no, seeing it's it. Black right now, huh? Maybe uh, stop sharing the screen and restart it. I'll stop sharing the screen and stop broadcasting. Okay, I did stop broadcasting. Wait. I'll go to Zoom and I'll there start. Bro- Hello, Ron. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can see and hear you. Yeah. Can you see it now? I think it's just coming up. Hmm. Can, you, can you see it? No, it's not coming up for some reason. Um, boom, boom, boom. I'll, I'll start again. I'll start, I'll try yeah. again. Can you hear me though? Yeah, we sure can hear you. So we can talk while I'm, while yeah, I'm. Yeah, yeah. Fiddling. Well, let me ask you that question then, because you're, you were moving in the late eighties into the early nineties into this totally different way of working. You're arriving in Italy as an outsider. Presumably you felt like an outsider in some yeah. ways. And then you have these generations of older designers and manufacturers to contend with. And you had to insert yourself into that situation. I'm just wondering what that was like for you. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I sort of made friends with, with, most, with most of the people I knew about. Like I'm telling you, like uh, actually, Ettore Resozas recorded it beautifully. He wrote an introduction to a book of mine. Yeah, that is beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, and he, he says, what, are there new, is there a new type of people? So, and that uh, anyway, and he was yeah. he was slow. He talks about how slow it took him time to see what I'm doing. And uh, he called you a new species, I think, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was amazing, and it made amazing to talk to to Castiglioni. Mm. I mean, like a highlight of my life was explaining uh, explaining 3D printing to to Achille Castiglioni. Look, mm. can I? Achille Castiglione something? Anyway, and uh, most people were, you know, nice, uh, curious, and, uh, and welcome, uh, welcoming. Mm. I mean, apart from, I mean, there was, someone asked uh, Enzo Mari something about my bookworm. Uh-huh, the bookworm shelf, yeah. Yeah, and he said, uh, merda pura, it's like a pure, pure shit. <laughs> well, Enzo Mari was not one to mince words. No, and, and then it was a British journalist, and that was the title. Ron Arad is pure shit. <laughs> and, and, and the thing Can't is that, that I, I admire his work. I think he's one of the better, one of the amazing designers. But anyway, hmm. let me see if, if we can come back to... Yeah, we'll get, let's give it one more try, because it was beautiful seeing the images and the videos. Okay. Start broadcast. Maybe it just needed a rest. Do you see it now? Mm, no. So I'll try again. Wait, wait, wait. Why not? Please. The mysteries of technology. Screen. Screen broadcast. Whoops. Start broadcast. Let's see if anything coming up. Do you see my screen now? You are sharing screen, it says. Yeah, it's just black, though. It's curious. It says Ron Arad has started screen sharing. Double click to enter full screen mode here. 
Double click to. Yeah, but that's just giving us more, more black. I think um, we, let's just talk, Ron, because we haven't had a chance to look at some images and there's so much to talk about. Um, okay, one, one question I wanted to ask you was about that moment when you transitioned into working with those companies. I was wondering about a, any sense of a loss of control that you might have had. In other words, did it feel, feel more like a negotiation and less like it was all your own show? Or did you find a way to use the companies expressively? Look, I mean, the first, the first company that asked me to design something for them was Vitra. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so that's Vitra, Rothenbaum, Baum, yeah? Yeah, so I went to... Um, I went to Vitra to visit the factory and I saw like 2,000 people working, machinery, you can do whatever you want. Wow, amazing. I came back and I did the, the well temperature that I yeah. put myself, I did my, I mean, I failed, I, I lost the opportunity there. And instead of doing something that I can't do without the industry, I did something that I had to teach them how to do. And uh, I don't regret it. It's still a favorite piece of mine. But, you know, later, later I, I did, I did uh, do like a, uh, Injection moldings and, and and industrial stuff like the Tom Buck chair and and, mm -hmm. and and but I always had like uh, I started with what I used to call studio pieces mm -hmm. like the workshops, the art, and then I translated it to industrial design. I mean, another good example is the bookworm. Mm -hmm. uh, I can, I can look here in the next room, but you can't see it. Uh, I, um, I did it as a, a, a piece, almost for me first. And then it was translated to, to Cartel's uh, best-selling piece. But it always started with a, a studio piece. It was tr tr translated to a mass-produced piece. And then you could even take the mass produced piece and it would generate new studio pieces or gallery based pieces, no? Like that, that bookworm had so many iterations. No, it, it, is, it is a two way now. Sometimes mm -hmm. if you take a, a piece like, uh, like the, the solid rocker mm -hmm. made of rods, very much like the Fiat, I took a piece that I did for Driade, uh, an industrial piece that I translated to a studio piece. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, there's no, you'll notice now, there's no rules, there's no, you know, when, uh, all the time that I taught at the Royal College of Art, I mean, one word we should, we never use this, should. There's no should. There's no, you should do this, or you should do that. There's no, no, uh, no false manifestos. Mm. Um, like so, so, um, yeah, mm. I'm dying to show you. Shall I, shall we try this sharing screen again? Up to you, you're the boss. I think we should just talk because I'm not sure it's gonna work. And I have um, just a couple more questions to ask you and then we can open it to the floor and have the audience ask. But okay. I did wanna just ask a couple of other questions, I suppose, philosophically. Um, it seems to me like in the 90s and ongoing to the present, although you have worked across a huge range of scope, like lots of different kinds of things, different scales, buildings down to, you know, jewelry and eyeglasses. It does seem to me like there's um, a particular type of thing you do, which is a, a, an object of extremely high production values. So let's say a seating object that's kinetic or carved by robots with text in it and has been worked on for months and months in some cases. So there's a, as, as at the same time that you're super prolific and generate ideas very quickly, there are also times when you concentrate a huge amount of resource into one object. And I wonder what you think the value of that is. Like, what is what does that concentration give you? Of no, no, I mean, like, like uh, right, you asked me about the uh, our time, the crisis or the disaster, I worked, I mean, on three big projects now, one for a show in, in LA, a show called Don't Fuck With a Mouse. 
Mm -hmm. It's it's a, a a series of pieces uh, rela celebrating Mickey Mouse's ninetieth birthday. Mm. Uh, if you want, if you want to go to the zine, uh, the current issue of the zine online, uh, I made a film about the whole story of it. So please go there because it's quite, I mean, very good images and and it talks about everything to do mm. with this. Project. So I, I won't waste time now. If you're curious, go there. If you're not, why should I show it to you anyway? We'll, we'll put up the link. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so there, uh, it's like going back to, and I, it's, some, it's, a, it's something I, uh, it's a series of 20 pieces. And I do, I did, I stopped doing now, but do one every Friday. And there I get 30 brushes, gel coats, polyester, and it's all completely, completely uh, like, uh, I think uh, Pollock would be very, very jealous of me. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking uh, about Pollock and Chamberlain too when we were looking at the cars, the crushed cars at Kasman, because yeah. It seems to me like, in a way, you're doing something quite funny there to do with the history of abstract expressionism. So it's Look, obvious everything, Chamberlain's everything, an obvious reference. Everything that, everything that happened in the world until four o'clock yesterday is a source of inspiration. Hmm. And uh, I mean, it, yes, there was Pollock and there was Chamberlain and there was Cesar and there was Arman and there was all, you know, lots of. I mean, I'm saying Garmin now, it relates to another project that we we sort of, like an exhibition we finished and before shipping, uh, we were locked down. Mm. It's called, to do with music and, uh, it, and, and violins and cellos and quartets that, that play themselves. I mean, they, the, the resonance body of the instrument mm. makes the music. Uh, I would show you. I can, I, yeah, I, that's I, a beautiful thing. Those those instruments are almost seeming to have a life of their own. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not very different from the life they they were given in Cremona when they were made, mm. because but instead of the strings vibrating them and making the music, it's a vibrator or mm. accelerator or actuator, different names, that is bonded to the to the maple and the sprut inside connected by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and, and, and plays exactly like, I mean, the music's recorded by amazing musician. I mean, the quartet is played by the Pacifica Quartet, an American amazing quartet, and, and, and various other great musicians are playing. Mm. Um, so- Can I ask you one last question before I turn it open to the audience on that point, which is a question about communication. And I'm also thinking here about Lolita, the great chandelier you did with Swarovski, where you could text the chandelier and it would speak to you. And you've also done a lot of uh, pieces that actually have text inscribed into them, written into them. And that's something that goes way, way back in your work to the 1980s. And I guess it just prompts um, a question that I have about the objects themselves having a voice. So whether you perceive them in some ways as having like a persona or a character or an independent life of their own after they leave your hands, or if you're more using them like a writer uses paper. Do you see what I'm asking? Like, how do you think of the yeah. act who's communicating? You know, when when they they leave. I mean, the nice thing about the tinker that I'm sh I'm really really sorry we didn't show it to you. I did about six of them, and there was a different. Uh, delight and pleasure in doing the first one and mm. then you learn something and you do the second one and uh, while you do the second one you have an idea for the third one and then by the sixth one am I repeating myself now? No, no. And I, I stop. No, I'm saying in, in the... Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, no, sorry. Am I repeating myself? <laughs> anyway, so and each one of them went to a different place in the world. Yeah. They, uh, and they are siblings that never met. Mm. And it's a big joy for me at, at my show at the Pompidou Center 
is that we managed to get five of them together. It's like five, mm. five brothers that never met themselves, ne never met each other before. And there you go, in the Pompidou Center, on the steps that we build there, there's five of them, like a, like a happy reunion of a, anyway. Mm. So yes, they, are, they exist, and once they're finished, <coughs> they, they, they are not entirely It implies, Ron, that you have a, quite a lot of empathy for the objects that you make. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, once I gave a talk in, uh, in Chicago, and there was a guy, a very... Maybe you know him. He's called uh, uh, what's his name, Lawrence Lorenzo, uh, a collector, uh, mm -hmm. a dealer. And after my lecture, he said, "You know, I have I have one of your big easy. You want to see that? You want to see it?" And I said, "Yes." And we went out of the place where I gave the lecture. Went to his van, and I saw, whoa. What a delightfully ugly piece. <laughs> I mean, I, I really loved it because I did it. It's one of the first ones that I didn't really know what I was doing. Mm. I mean, or I, I got better and better. But it had something in it that, that I loved. And I was uh, very jealous of him that he, that that he had it. Yeah. Those yeah. initial moments of exploration when they're crystallized in an object can be very, very powerful, can't they? When you're still, we're just searching for something and finding it in the object and you can feel that in the thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's take some questions from the audience, shall we? Let's. Okay. So first we have a question from Max Hornacker. Where from? Yeah, hello. Hi. Hey, um, can you hear me? We can. Can we, see you? can we see you as well? Can we? Yes, of course we can. Here I am. No, can I see you? Hopefully. We can't Hi. see you, but go ahead and can ask you your question. Then, Max. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I'm a design product student from the Royal College of Art, and I was wondering what. Uh, uh, oh, hi everyone. Hi. Um, okay. What do you think about uh, shifting all the online teaching and the virtual show and making the show virtual, the graduation show? So uh, leaving out all the material aspect of our project and the materiality and the interaction the audience could have with our uh, product. For what, for what reason? I mean, were you asking me if can, we can live with this uh, new Was condition? This, it's because, Ron, because of the coronavirus, the RCA has decided not to have a, a material show. It's only virtual and online. Yeah, people do People do what they can. You know, I'm, I talked to, talk to you, I was working about a, a very ambitious piece for for the summer show at the Royal Academy. Mm. It's not going to happen. So what we're doing now is we are building the space of where we will show it, and we'll make it possible for people to like walk around it and see it. Uh, it's interesting, you know. A lot of interesting things will will uh, will emerge, and but this is not to, in some of you know some of us will get completely taken by this virtual thing if you do good work fantastic but uh i i will me i mean like also it happens in the work when you do like a, a project uh today you can see a photograph and you can do a movie and walk in a building that doesn't exist and see it from every angle and why bother doing it Mm. Uh, we have lots of projects that are like that. There's a pleasure in actually seeing it for real. And there's a big, if, if what you do is not, once it's done, it's not better than your renders, you're in trouble. <laughs> and also, I think. also now we were approached by a company that, that uh, sell and deal with virtual real estates. And they ask us to do like, they want to have like uh, buildings of mine and pieces so they can have it on their sort of arena and people can buy them. I'm interested in that. It's, it's interesting. It's not my passion to do it, but curiosity is always an element in whatever you do. And I'm curious to see what it means. And yes, unfortunately, we have some great architecture that wasn't built 
that's not because of Corona, because of mm. people. <laughs> uh, and and it, if it gives us a chance to give it another life, uh, we'll have a look at it. But I won't, I won't uh, go and, and celebrate it as, wow, look what's happening. I mean, uh, I mean, I like the crushed car, same as I like the, the virtual crushed. Actually, not true, I like the real one better. True for today. So you do feel like there's something lost when the materiality is lost. So I feel like that's part of what Max is asking. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Mm. What do you think you would do if you were in the situation if somebody told you that you had a show coming up and it had to be only virtual? How would you react? I'll, I'll cry. I mean, how will I, how will I react? I mean, the, well, I'll tell you what, the show of, of the quartet mm -hmm. and temporary name Domestic Violins, uh, the museum wants it installed now before the lockdown uh, is uh, finished. And I explained to them that the pleasure of the, this piece is that you are walking around the instrument. You can walk between the cello and the viola. Yeah. You can, you can see it. And my as possible solution that I have is that we'll, we might do it. And we might every day get a personality, mm. someone to go and visit the show and be filmed there, and we'll see them enjoying it, and we'll see we'll we'll have it will be animated by a small mm. two people with two meters between them or one. I don't know. I don't know. We are we are thinking we did something that is sort of. Something that unfortunately we have fantastic videos, fantastic pictures, but it's not the same. Yeah. It's not the same. Let's and take um not, some not because of the, the, the tactile material, it's because of the uh, audio material. Yeah. Let me um turn to another RCA student who's asking a comment of Are you at the RCA? Uh, Rock, you are up if you have a question. Hello. Hang on. Where are you? Rook. Yes. Are you at the college? No, I'm at my room. <laughs> now no, my room. Are you, college are, you now. A student, are you a student at the RCA? Yeah, yeah, we are mates with Max here. Mm -hmm. What's Max? Right. How is it? How is it since I left? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always pros and cons, but I think there's more pros and cons for now. What cons? What pros? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that the RCA uh, somehow they they relate to my period as the anarchic period, the mm -hmm. the one they have to change, the one uh, they want back back to order. My I I was the anarchist, and huh. I mean, I think we had a very good time there. There's lots of very good graduates. Some of them are showing with your gallery. Uh, Glenn? Yeah. Go on. Sorry. Right. What's your question? Well, it's a, it's a very you know, easy question. I see on your work um, lots of inspiration from craft and mass manufacture. You're kind of in between those two worlds, uh, or you were. So, what do you think about the connection between mass manufacturing and craft? Because many people say that craft is dying now. And uh, how do you feel about it? About it? Uh, I love, I love crafts people. I mean, like, uh, I don't know if you know the pieces I did with Murano with the glasses. Where are my glasses? Mm. So it relies totally about about masters that blow glass. And my last collection I did in in Africa in Dakar for Moroso. Did, did you see it? Do you know it? I'm just gonna put no. up the um, the link. The Mudo the Mudo collection. Mm -hmm. And after you work with amazing Italian craftsmen, you go to Senegal. And you work with young, with young uh, people from Dakar, and it's a different world that is sort of amazing. You cannot but admire them. The people that bend the tubes, they make the tools to bend the tubes. The people that weave, uh, 
I, I, I won't, it's not, it cannot be replaced by uh, 3D printers and five axis milling machines. Mm. And sometimes, some things you can only do with, uh, with uh, five axis milling machines or with, or with uh, 3D printing. Mm -hmm. When I wanted to show the video that I showed you, Glenn, of the, of the mechanical woodpecker, mm. the computer mm -hmm. robot carving it, tool, yeah. It, yeah, when I wanted to show it in my show in Geneva where it was shown for the first time, the galleries told me, no, the last thing I want people to see, my client to see, is, is the machine that's doing it. I want them to imagine you like Michelangelo with a chisel. <laughs> And I thought, it, I thought it's a great film. Show it to people. Share it with people. Hmm. And anyway. Let's go on to another question because we just have a couple more minutes and two more questions. So uh, can we get a question from George Raynal, please? Hi, I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for um, telling us about your designs and sharing some with us. It's great to see them. Um, I think following from Rock's question, my question is, um, about your endeavor for to make P PQ eyewear and wondering if you could give us an update on the status. I'm in the United States and um, it was never quite easy to find the product here um, and as someone who uh, won't won't likely have an opportunity to own a big easy it, it, it interests me to own um, some of your work in a more consumer fashion so so I'm wondering if you could tell us about your experience um, with that project. Um, we uh, were approached by a guy that he, he had it in his head that I should design an eyewear collection for him. And he was very motivated and, and he, managed to, he managed to blow it up because uh, he, he, he jumped from one idea to the other and from one investor to the other and another investor to the point that at one point we, we, we worked on, on customizing uh, eyewear, which is an interesting idea, but it's not where it ends or starts. So other things were neglected. And so, so the whole brand is now on stop. And uh, we are starting to do some new pieces uh, with a Spanish company. And it is, uh, luckily, we kept all the uh, IP with us. Mm -hmm. And we are still friendly with the, with the guy that, that started the company. But uh, um, we, the, the collection is looking for a new outing now. Okay, thanks, Ron. Uh, thanks for that question uh, very much, Todd. Uh, and, um, or George, sorry. And now let's go to Laura Petrovich Cheney. Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, I have a quick let, question. Let, let, let me find you. I'm, I'm... Go, ahead, go ahead, Laura. I think your face will come up when you speak. Okay, okay Laura. I have a quick question about your gender and how your gender I'm has male. influenced <laughs> your work. Can you see me? Yeah, no, you can. I can. I can't see you. Where, where? I can see you now, right. Okay. So how uh, has your gender influenced your work? Um, Particularly uh, the, crushed, the crushing. <laughs> I mean, do you think... Uh, I think uh, a woman designer can happily stand next to the people that operate the press and crush whatever she wants. Uh, I don't think, look, it's up to you. I, I can't help it. I am, I was, I have my gender and I don't think that, uh, I don't see as what I do as like, ooh, we are, uh, I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. I eat a lot so of spinach. Ron, let, can I push you on this a little bit? Because, you know, there's being male and there's also being macho. And I think there's a certain kind of swagger to a lot of the physicality of your work now. You can see as quite gendered. 
I, I, I don't see it, but uh, I, if, if that's what you see and that's your interpretation, I told you at the beginning of the talk, I don't mind wrong interpretation. Mm. Uh, I, I really, I mean, look, once I do it, it's up to you to, to embrace it or to reject it or to love it or to hate it. But I don't think macho, I don't think I, my design is, is macho. And I think, uh, I don't know, but maybe I don't know. Maybe, maybe you know better than me. Well, it's one interesting thing, I suppose, is you say, if you don't mind wrong interpretation, then maybe that implies that there is no right and wrong interpretation. It's more like this kind of conversational situation where the object goes out into the world and it makes new things happen. And you're kind of embracing that, no? I think, I think you put it very well. Yeah. Let's take uh, one last question in that spirit. So from Todd Cook. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hey, see God. me? Yeah, I sure can. Um, thanks so much, Ron and Glenn, for doing this. Um, it's been great to hear you discuss your career. By the way, career. I'm doing it because of the crisis. And there's no way I would do a, a Zoom live interview with, with uh, what is it, Friday, 5 o'clock here. Yeah. No, the new... The new possibilities that that this crisis offers us. Yeah, it's what we call a silver lining, right? This is yeah. Come on, silver lining, Todd. Yes. No, it's been great for for all of us. Um, I was just wondering if you think that designers have any new responsibilities in this age of Anthropocene. Um, and I was particularly wondering, um, wanted to hear your opinion, given that you work with so many um, byproducts of mass manufacture and um, forms of industrial detritus? I think we always have, we always have uh, responsibility. Uh, we, I see Jennifer now. I didn't see her before. Hi, Jennifer. Um, we, yeah, I mean, we have, we have to look after the environment. We have to make sure that when we design something is not done by child slavery or any kind of slavery, that whatever you do is good. We also have the, the responsibility to make uh, things that will bring people delight. Mm. Um, culture as a whole is surplus to requirement. No one needs a new chair by you. Are you a chair designer? Or by me? It, we don't need it. The world can be a happy place without any new uh, chair or table or new cutlery or whatever. But the world would be a very boring place if, uh, if you didn't design new chairs or if, mm -hmm. if we didn't write poetry or if you didn't play music. Uh, I mean, it's like if you're, if you're hungry, you'll eat anything. Mm -hmm. if, there's, if there's food, you have chefs and cookbooks and recipes and you go to a gourmet and great restaurants. They're not necessary. They are surplus to requirement, but that is culture. Now, some people are very, uh, they think that their job is to do things out of recycled uh, material. Yes, it's recycled, but it's ugly and it's uncomfortable. Thank you very much. But uh, I'm, it doesn't have to be, it can be amazing and fantastic. And if something is, is um, you know, we talked about the Robertshire, I can go back to it. It was celebrated by Friends of the Earth and they put it on the front cover of the magazine as an example hmm. of how things should be, you know, reclaimed and blah, blah, blah in 81. Wrong interpretation of my motivation, but I was very happy with it. I was very happy that I amused myself. By the way, do you know that, that Prove copied me like 50 years before I was born? <laughs> with, with that a, devil. <laughs> with a chair that there's only one photograph of it, three quarters, and no one has seen it. Not uh, Wolf Elbaum, not the daughter of Prove that I talked about it, 
Hmm. After I did the, the Prove, the Prove, after I did the Robertshire, uh, I discovered that it has a lot of similarity to a Prove chair. Check it out. Different things. I'm not. Hmm. I had, uh, there's one book I didn't return to the library at the AA. It's a Prove book. <laughs> I, but I paid the fine. Okay, so, well, no, it's so you they're that. watching, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it, there's a book you didn't return. The, there's a fine. So said, okay, I paid the fine, and I kept the book. I still have the book. Hmm. So, and, um, and, and uh, anyway, I look, the chair is there. I don't know what is better for me to say that I was aware of it when I did the rubber chair, or I wasn't. Hmm. I, I really, honestly, don't know. So the Friends of the Earth put it on the cover. They were enjoying it, and I enjoyed the fact that they enjoyed it. But I was more interested in, in found object in Marcel Duchamp, in, uh, in, in Picasso's bicycle seat with the, with the handlebar, the Toro, with, with uh, the bottle racks. Mm. I was more interested in, in, in Dada than I was interested in, in, in the Green Movement that was yeah, I was very, very happy to join. You were reading every copy of Art Forum, I understand, in those days too, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, I just wanted to cite something that I heard Joris Larman say, just in relation to what you've been talking about. So somebody asked him the question, basically, the world is full, why do you keep making new chairs? And he said that's like asking a musician why he makes new songs, and there's already plenty to listen to. And um, I want to use that as a segue, uh, Lucy, if you could unmute everybody. I wanted to ask if we could sing happy birthday to Ron Harris. Thank you. Oh. Lucy and I, Lucy, you're going to lead us here. So, you ready? One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. To you. Happy birthday, happy birthday, dear Rob. Happy birthday to you. 